and all who are thirsty and all who are weak come to the fountain dip your heart in the stream of life let the pain and the sorrow be washed away in the waves of his mercy as deep cries out to Jesus Christ, I think upon your sacrifice, you became nothing, poured out to death, and many times I've wandered at your gift of life, and I'm in that place once again, and I'm in that place once once again, once again I look upon that cross where you died. I'm humbled by your mercy and I'm broken inside. Once again I thank you, once again I pour out my Jesus Christ, I think upon your sacrifice, you became nothing, poured out to death. And many times I've wandered at your gift of life, I'm in that place once again. And I'm in that place once again. And once again, I look upon that cross where 
to the highest place, King of the heavens, where one day I'll bow. But for now, I marvel at this saving grace, and I'm full of praise once again. And I'm full of praise once again. Once again, I look upon that cross where you died. I'm humbled by your mercy, and I'm broken inside. Once again, I thank you. Once again, I pour out my life. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the cross, thank you for the cross, my friend. Thank you for the cross, thank you for the cross, thank you for the cross, my friend. Thank you for the cross, oh thank you for the cross. again I look upon that cross where you died. I'm humbled by your mercy and I'm broken inside. Once again I thank you. Once again I pour out my life. And God, your so good. God, you're so good. God, you're so good. You're so good to me. Amazing love. me, the kindness of mercy that bought with blood wholeheartedly my soul undeserving. God, your soul to 
What Calvary has but for me, both now and forever, God, you're so good, God, you're so good, God, you're so good. I'm coming, I'm coming. Thanks, you guys. That was great. Michelle, you have a beautiful voice. I love it. Good morning, everybody. Nice to see you. Yeah, thank you for that because we appreciate our worship team. How's everybody doing this morning? Good to see you. Ready for another week studying God's Word? Um, I thought it was interesting, this week in our lesson, we have all these believing Pharisees. I thought that was interesting. Isn't that kind of like an oxymoron? Believing Pharisees. And they are telling all these brand new Gentile believers, wait, there's something you have to do. You have to do something for salvation. Did, that, did you catch that? You have to do something. And I could really relate because... The culture that I grew up in, in the Christian culture, was about doing something. So I grew up in the Baptist church. I told you that last week. But when I was 15, we got a new pastor. And when the new pastor came in, the culture of our church really changed. It changed, um, well, when I was a kid, I don't remember what it used to be. But it changed to a much more legalistic culture. So the pastor came in, and all of a sudden it was about you got to be at every single service. You have to be there when the doors are open. It became very judgmental about anything that wasn't Baptist. Because, you know, John the Baptist was Baptist, so everybody should be a Baptist, right? So I didn't even, I didn't even process that Methodists or Lutherans or, Christ, or, or Catholics could be believers. Even uh, Billy Graham was kind of like secondary, right? So this church really elevated itself and its beliefs, and it kind of was judgmental. And it taught me and all, this, all of us high school girls and kids that boys had to have, like, white walls because in the 70s, you know, boys wore their hair, like, down to here, and now all of a sudden they had to have really short hair, and girls had to wear dresses. It was abomination for a woman to wear men's clothing. There's a verse, like, in Deuteronomy or something about that. So my, all my high school years, I wore dresses every single day to school and carried my Bible right on top of all my books. And I, those four years of high school, it was drilled into me that the Christian walk is about what you do. And I really believed that. I really believed it, that if I wear dresses, then, then I'm a good Christian girl. Or if I carry my Bible so everybody can see it, then I'm a really good Christian girl. And my relationship with God was just like, I don't even know what. It was about what I did. I told you last week, we did the bus ministry. How much visitation I can do made me a good Christian, right? And I don't remember much about a relationship part. So then when I, uh, after I graduated from high school, I went to Liberty University for college. And that was kind of a God thing too because Jerry Falwell was on the Sunday morning TV every Sunday at 9 o'clock, so I watched him, and then they had a singing group come to my town when I was a junior in high school, and that's all I knew of Liberty University. You know, you can't go online and study on, up on it. That's all I knew was the, the church, was the TV, and when they came. But I decided that's where I wanted to go to school. 
And that's a whole long story anyway, but it's really a fun story to tell, but I'm not telling that one today. Um, so anyway, I get there, and the first week of school, they have like a revival meeting church every single night. And for the first time in my life, I heard that a relationship with God is about a love relationship. It's not about all the things you do. And I, I was skeptical. I was like, that can't be right. I've never heard that before. Um, but then God began to do a work in my life where he, I was desperately lonely and horribly homesick. And I cried all the time. And God just took that um, weakness, that, that lostness, and he just filled it in with himself. And it was in the early days of Liberty University, so um, they didn't have a campus. They didn't have dorms. Uh, I, my, the dorms we lived in was like a, a hotel in inner city Lynchburg, Virginia. So inner city, just picture inner city. That's where we lived. There was no grass. There was no trees. There was nothing. And I was just like starved for, for trees. <laughs> so my, my room was on the fourth floor. And if I hung myself way out the window and looked way out there, I could see this little group of trees that were about this big. So at night, I really would hang out the window and just like feast on those trees and just pray. And I'm not kidding. It was just like God just swarmed me with who his, the reality of a relationship with him. He swarmed me with this love that was so personal that I had never really experienced, even though I grew up in the church and did all the things. And it was like the first time I got it, that it's not about all the things we do. It's about who we are in our relationship with God. And for the first time, I just felt like, oh, my gosh, I love God. And, and he loves me. And when I talk to him, it's like he is right here. And that, it changed my life. I have never been the same. And that was a long time ago. I've never been the same since then. It marked the whole rest of my life with this realness of this relationship with God. So I'm really thankful that Good Shepherd isn't that like that, right? Like the Good Shepherd is not like the church I grew up. But it is really easy for me to still fall back into the trap of I got to do all the right things. I'm going to Bible study. I really have to have my lesson done, right? You would be ashamed of me if I showed up in your group without my lesson done. Now, I haven't been doing the highlighting lately, so then I'm like, shoot, am I going to get in trouble for that? <laughs> do I have to do it, right? Somebody said yes over here. <laughs> but really, is it about, it's, it's about we go to our Bible study because we want to hear from God. We go to our Bible study for the relationship with him, not about having something written on our page when we get here, Right? That's the doing. God wants us to have a relationship of being, where he feeds us through the word, for we are about being with him, not all the things we do for him. And when I think about myself and when I think about us, that's who I want us to be. I want us to be women who are with God, not just doing things for God, who have a love relationship with him, who hear from him, who talk to him, who knows what it's like to have the Holy Spirit indwelling us and communicating through us, that's who I want us to be. That's, that's who I want. So I really took this lesson to heart, and I was so thankful for uh, Peter and James and all those people that they recognized it, right? It's not about all the things we do. It is really about the grace of God. And thank goodness for that. Okay, that's all I wanted to say about that. Um, a couple of announcements for us. Uh, I've still There's still some cards back there for Ignite. March uh, 4th, I believe, is the date. That's a one-day thing. It would be really good. We just have March 4th is a one-day. Is it 5th? Thank you. March 5th. And then the uh, IF conference is that same weekend. It's a Friday night, Saturday event, and that's an online thing, so you just have to sign up, and then you get access to it. And once you get access to it, you can, I think, Depending on what level of access, I think you can have access to those videos for a year. So even if you can't get to it on March 4th and 5th, you can still um, click back into it uh, a year later. And then there's still the Dunes Scholarship sheet and prayer sheets back there. So Dunes is not this weekend, it's next weekend. So we just need to be praying for those kids. Right now is when they're deciding whether they're going to come and whether they're going to go. So pray that the Lord would just bring those people that need to be there that week and that he would just really use that time. 
And then last but not least, tomorrow is Mom to Mom, and we have a really great speaker at Mom to Mom tomorrow, Hollis Winsel. And uh, so if you're a mom with little kids or if you're a woman that wants to come and hear about soul care, we're going to have that be on the agenda for tomorrow. All right, I think that's all my announcements. Now I'm really excited to get to have Raquel as she's going to come and speak for us this morning. Oh, you can go ahead and clap for her while she's coming up. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. All right, here we are again, standing on the cloud. <laughs> I feel like I'm standing on the cloud anyway. Okay. <clears throat> you ready? Let's pray. Father, we thank you for yourself. We thank you for the gospel. We thank you for the cross. And we thank you for salvation. And we praise you, Jesus, that now we ask you to speak to our hearts, to revive us, to renew us, and to lift us up and understand how beloved we are in you. Amen. All right. So have you ever been on an absolutely wonderful trip? And are you dying to share your experience with your friends who stayed back home. Well, last month, me and my husband, we went, we went for five weeks to the Middle East. This, last week we returned, visiting, we had visited our kids for five weeks, and they lived in Jordan. As you can imagine, it was a fascinating five weeks. And yes, I do have a lot I could tell you, but not right now. That has to be for another time. I'd love to show you all my 600 slides. <laughs> well, they're not slides. They're on my phone. They're pictures. But I could put them on slides. Last week, we learned that Paul and Barnabas had just returned from their first missionary journey in the region. They were now in Antioch, and you see that's inside the circle, the place where they had originally been commend commended to the grace of God for the work that they had gone to do. And they were excited. And so as they gathered the, op the church, they shared all that God had done and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. You can almost feel how their hearts are just bursting with joy and excitement over all that they had seen God do in and through them. And the text tells us that this was not a quick one-time report moment. No, it says. And they remained no little time with the disciples. Well, as far as I know, that means that they were there for a while. All right? All was good. All was well. They had seen the gospel take root among the Gentiles and churches had been planted. And the good news had been proclaimed. And then as we open chapter 15, our text today, it starts with the word, but. And you know something is coming. What could possibly warrant a but right here? Well, let's see. But some man, men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers. Unless you are circumcised according to the customs of Moses, you cannot be saved. Ooh, what was that all about? It was almost as if when God is at work, the enemy gets busy sowing discord. Who were they? These men, or as it says in another translation, certain men. Well, although they were Jews, they were Jews who had embraced the faith. Not really sure how, but these folks were, had also continued to be very zealous about the law. And they had a strong Jewish learning, leaning so that they were called Judaizers. And some of these folks had now come to Antioch. And they were just kind of mingling among the believers, insisting that the Gentiles may become Christians, but only after first becoming Jews and submitting to Jewish rituals, including circumcision. Wow. This kind of, I see, not going. Here we go. Thank you. Wow, this kind of teaching 
countered everything that Paul and Barnabas had been sharing with the Gentiles and that they now had reported to the church in Antioch. Because on this, their first missionary journey, they had proclaimed the gospel and planted churches among the Gentiles without bringing them under the law of Moses. In fact, in Acts 13, Paul had preached, and by him, everyone who believes is freed from everything from which you could not be freed by by the law of Moses. Wow. Basically declaring that person can only be right with God on the basis of what Jesus had done through his death and resurrection. But the guys coming down from Judea, they insist, no, uh, Paul and Barnabas, they are wrong. But you know what? Paul and Barnabas, they had seen God at work through the Holy Spirit in such an incredible way during their travel that as they had been preaching and planting churches. There was no way in the world that they were going to back off on anything that they had been teaching. In fact, the text tells us, oh dear, Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and deep debate with them. That's pretty nice to say that. I think they had intensive arguments. <laughs> I'm, gonna look, I'm looking forward to meeting Paul, are you? He's a really cool guy. <laughs> he was really out there. Paul was adamant because he would then later on as he wrote his epistles in the New Testament, he would include that no matter how strictly a person kept the law of Moses, it, it, it of itself could not bring salvation. It was salvation by grace based on what Jesus had done through his death and resurrection. And he didn't only oppose these Judaizers' teaching, but he also saw them as being both dangerous to the spread of the gospel, and propagators of grievous doctrinal errors. Wow. Let's look a little closer at these guys who were stirring up trouble. Who were they? Well, in the early church, there were some Jewish believers who actually believed that the gospel should be a combination of God's grace and human effort. That is pretty dumb. They were called Judaizers. And the word Judaizers, you had looked up. It comes from the Greek verb me meaning to live according to Jewish customs, of course. They believed, here we go again, that Gentile converts needed to first be initiated into Judaism through circumcision, ouch, and then live under the law of Moses if they were to be right with God. And be embraced into the Christian community because they believed that it was the law that saved you. And you know what? This, it was this group of Christian Pharisees, if, that's a really interesting wording, who had now come to Antioch trying to set the church straight. Insisting that these Gentile converts must be instructed to submit to circumcision and all the general obligations of the Mosaic law, which that included. So it's not a surprise, is it, that these guys were, the, the Judaizers were really upset that Paul and Barnabas had uh, actually allowed the Gentiles to come to Jesus without first coming through the law of Moses. They were upset. But Paul and Barnabas would not give in. They stood firm. And as we just read, had they had no small dissension and debate with them. So it's important to understand right here that this additional teaching was not a new problem, appearing only in Antioch. We know that pro the problem had existed down in South Galatia, Galatia in the middle of Turkey and then the south, where Paul and Barnabas had just visited on their first missionary journey. And Paul, therefore, had spent a large Poor, he would spend a large portion of his letter to Galatians dealing with the issue of circumcision as a gateway to salvation. And the letter to the Galatians is thought to have been written right before, when they came back to Antioch, and right before they went to the Council of Jerusalem. So it was fresh in his mind. And it is in the, the Galatians 2, 15 and 16, that Paul writes this. We ourselves, him... And his, some of his friends are Jews by birth and not Gentile sinners. Well, that was true. Yet we know that a person is not justified by works of the law, but through faith in Jesus Christ. 
So we also have believed in Christ Jesus in order to be justified by faith in Christ and not by works of the law. Because by works of the law, no one will be justified. He insisted. He insisted that to add anything to the work that Christ did for salvation is to negate God's grace. No, we are saved by grace alone, through faith alone, not by returning to the law. In Ephesians 2.8, that Paul would write later on, actually in the 60s, he said like this, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one can boast. That verse, ladies, I think we should all memorize and tuck in to our heart. That is by grace you've been saved through faith. It is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. And then in the Galatians 2.21, he clearly states, I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. I do not set aside the grace of God. For if righteousness could be gained through the law, Christ died for nothing. You know what? I'm not really sure that we understand, truly understand how important of an issue this was for the young church. Pastor Guzik says in it, David Guzik, he says in a commentary in this chapter, he's pretty good actually, this was not a side issue. It had to do with salvation itself, how one is made with, right with God. This was not a matter where you could be in disagreement among the believers with some believing you must be under the law and some believing that was not important. This was an issue that went to the core of Christianity and it had to be resolved. We can just imagine how Satan, he says, wanted to take advantage of this situation. First, he wanted the false doctrine of righteousness by works to succeed. And then if that didn't succeed, Satan wanted a costly, bitter, doctrinal war to completely split and sour the church. This may be the greatest threat to the work of the gospel yet seen in the book of Acts. I thought that was so good, I had to read it to you. And so the discussion went on with the Judaizers. It went on and on and on. I don't know how long. And there did not seem to be a way out. These guys did not want to change. So the church in Antioch wisely decided that Paul and Barnabas and some other guys too should travel to Jerusalem to discuss the matter with the apostles. And off they went. This is the coolest thing. So being sent on their way by their church, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria and describing in detail the conversation of the Gentiles. And they brought great joy to all the brothers. All the par Paul and Barnabas, listen, to were on their way to discuss some really serious and intricate matters in Jerusalem. What was their focus? Their focus was on God. And they had to share what God had done. And they brought what? Great joy among the believers. But they finally got to Jerusalem. He's a little slow today. There we are. <laughs> they finally got to Jerusalem. And when we learn that they were well, and there we learn that they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders. And once again, they declared all that God had done with them. Oh, they just had to share the good news of God at work among the Gentiles. And then we encounter another. But, let's see. Can you get that slide back, please? Yeah, there we are. In verse 5, but some believers, interesting, who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to order, to keep, and to order them to keep the law of Moses. Oh, there we are again, the same problem. 
now coming from within the Pharisee, Pharisaic believers in Jerusalem. So it was time to tackle the problem head on. And they did. They're not leaving anything, leaving groups and fringes of the church to figure out things on their own or make decisions based upon how they feel, felt about things. No, the way of the believers and the apostles went about is very interesting. And we have a lot to learn from them. Because, here we go. Verse 6 and 7 tells us exactly how it happened. It's just a short sentence, but it is loaded. The apostles and the elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up. And we're going to talk about that in a little bit. But Liz, did you see what we just read? They gathered together. They got together. They considered the matter and they debated the issue. I read the following most awesome commentary by a na man named Matthew Henry. And I thought, well, he's just sort of a guy from the early century. I looked him up. He lived 1692. And he wrote like this. They did not give their judgment separately, but they came together to do it. And they might, that they might hear one another sense in this matter and they did not give their judgment rashly but they considered the matter though they were clear and the clear concerning it in their own minds yet it would take time to consider it and to hear what might be said by the adverse party here he says matthew henry says is a direction to pastors of churches where difficulties arise to come together in solemn meetings for mutual advice and encouragement that they might know one another's mind and strengthen one another's hand and act in concert. Wow, that guy lived a long time ago. He still saw it. So what was the issue? The issue was, of course, are we made right with God by faith alone or by a combination of faith and obedience to the law of Moses? Is the work of Jesus by itself enough to save the ones who trust in Jesus? Or must we add our works to Jesus' works to be made right with God's? And after there had been much debate, Peter stood up and said to them, did you notice? Yeah, it is the same Peter who in the letter to Galatians, Paul is taken apart. Because he's just ripping Peter apart and says, you were really messed it up when you got up there. Yeah. Peter's view of the whole, he couldn't make up his mind about Jews and Gentiles, but he eventually did. Because here, he stood up and he boldly declared. And what did he say? We're going to go through it word by word, ladies. It is so good. He said, but brothers, sisters, you know that in the early days, God made a choice among you that by my mouth, Peter's mouth, the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. Remember Cornelius? Peter was a first-hand witness of the gospel going to the Gentiles. And God, who knows the heart, bore witness to them, the Gentiles, by giving them the Holy Spirit, just as he did to us. And he made no distinction between us and them, having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why... We're going to go back. There we are. Therefore, why are you putting God to test by placing a yoke on the neck of these disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as they will. That was quite a powerful, powerful little thing Peter got out when he stood up. What was the response? I think this is the coolest thing in the whole world. The whole assembly fell silent. There was no further debate, no discussion, no arguments, no yelling, no screaming, nothing. They fell silent and turned to what? They turned to listen to Paul and Barnabas again, who once again related signs and wonders that God had done through them among the Gentiles. Another witness testimony to God at work. And after they had shared, it was what? James turned to stand up. And it's worth to notice that James, this James is not the apostle James who was martyred in Acts 12. He was still very much alive. This was the one traditionally known as 
James the Just. He must have been a pretty awesome guy. He was the half-brother of Jesus. He was the brother of Jude. And he is the author of the book of James. So, and it, it, it appears that he was part of the leadership among the elders in Jerusalem. And it might have been that the circumcision party thought, okay, we got our guy here. He's going to talk for us. But you know what? He did not take their side. Instead, he summarized what Peter had said. He indicated that he personally was convinced that God had clearly shown his pleasure that the community which was to display God's glory in the world should be drawn from Gentiles as well from Jews. And that the prophecy from Amos 9.11 hereby was fulfilled. And what was the prophecy all about? After this, I will return, I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen. I will rebuild its ruins and I will restore it, that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who makes these things known from all. And then, this is the nicest thing. James adds, therefore, it is my judgment that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God. They're supposed to be saved too. But we probably should add this. We should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, and what had been strangled and from blood. If you, like me, you read that and you say, what's up? Why is James throwing in practic these particular practical instructions right here? Well, there's a reason. There's actually a really good reason. When I first read this Bible commentary again. And he said, James' decision that Gentile believers should not be under the Mosaic law was also given with practical instructions. The idea was that it was important that Gentile believers should not act in a way that would offend the Jewish community in every city and destroy the church's witness among the Jews. No, Gentile believers should be asked to respect their Jewish brethren and do so by abstaining from these things that they quoted. This would make life between Gentile Christians and Jewish Christians a lot smoother. They picked up a few things because the Jews were so adamant on this do, 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 do. Well, we'll give you a few things to do. And these things look act are actually really good. They had nothing to do with salvation. So, what happened? They all agreed. Yeah, they all agreed. As one commentary put it, they allowed themselves to be convinced by the evidence of Scripture and by the confirmation of Holy Spirit, and I would add to, and by the personal witness and testimony. To confirm what had taken place at the Council of Jerusalem, they wrote a letter. They wrote a letter. Ha! I wonder what it looked like. And they recapped everything the Council had decided. Well, we're not going to read it, but I'm going to read it to you. Because it's still good. And I hope you really pay some attention when you, when you look at it, okay? From the brothers, well, I added from because that was omitted. From the brothers, both the apostles and the elders, to the brothers who are of Gentiles in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. Now, why only those places? Well, that is where the, the Judaizers has, had infiltrated a lot, all right? Since we heard that some persons had gone out from us and troubled you with words, unsettling your minds, although we gave them new, no instructions, we didn't do it. It has seemed good to us, having come to one accord, to choose men and send them to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul. So I thought, why is that important? Well, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by the word of mouth. Here it is. They are sending a personal witness to what happened in that room. They're not sending a photocopy of the letter they wrote. They're not even sending a scanned picture of that letter. They're sending two people who were there in the room and saw it happen, who heard it, Judas and Silas. A personal testimony is very important. If you think of that, that when you read the book of Acts, it often is, there often is a personal testimony, a physical testimony. I saw it. I was there. All right? For it, and then he goes on, and he's, the letter goes on. It has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. 
to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements, that you abstain from what is sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled to sexual immorality. If you keep yourself from these, you will do well. Farewell. Okay, goodbye. That's a good letter, and we got in on it. Remember who wrote the book of Acts? Luke. All right, was Luke there? Yes, I believe so. It doesn't say that Luke said. Later on he says, we did this and we did that. He was part of it. But anyway, so after that, they went down to Antioch. And having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. And when they had read it, they rejoiced because of the encouragement. Here it is again. They rejoiced. There was joy. You know, joy is talked about about three or four times in this passage. And this time it was because the letter was an encouragement and it carried clear instructions. Yes, James had voiced the decision of a council, but you know the unity behind that decision was the work of the Holy Spirit who spoke through James and confirmed it throughout. How do we know that? Because he said it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. The issue of salvation was settled once and for all. And what like Paul wrote later on in Ephesians, for by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works, so that no one may boast. The potential for division and breakdown in the church with the Judaizers coming and infiltrating and teaching heresy was now averted. And because the situation was handled correctly, the church was built up. Judas and Silas, they exhorted and strengthened the brethren with many words, as did Paul and Barnabas as they stayed and continued teaching. So, now we're through the passage. What are we to think? This is not just a powerful narrative, ladies, describing a watershed event in the history of the early church. It also carries some great examples of conduct as, uh, for us as believers, especially when it comes to the ultimate focus, unity, and conflict resolution among believers. As we look at, at Paul and Barnabas, the example those guys are, first of all, they're filled by the Holy Spirit to the, to the top. I mean, they stood for truth. They were eager whenever they went to report and share what God had done. And threw them on their journey and taking the gospel to Gentile. And this brought joy. They were not consumed by the difficulties ahead of them where they were going. They were focused on God, what he had done and who he is and what he's doing. And they also submitted to the decision of the church leadership. And they went. They could have said, oh, we don't, we need, we don't need to go. We know it all. No, they went. They submitted. And then we have the examples of the apostles and leadership in Jerusalem. They were willing to take on this tricky conflict. And they headed, they went into it right on with a focus of settling the main issue. And what was the main issue? How are we right with God? And what is salvation? They came together. They considered the matter. And they debated the issue. And they searched the scriptures as James refers to the prophecy in Amos. And they relied on witness testimony. Many of them were first-hand witnesses of what God was doing among them. And here is the coolest thing of all. They invited the Holy Spirit into the discussion. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. And that leaves you and me with, what are we supposed to do now? I got some really cool things for you. Here. We focus on God. Who he is. And what he's done in every situation we find ourselves. We stand for truth. We preserve our unity by concentrating on coming together and listening well and acting well. And we invite the Holy Spirit into all that we do and say. And then we can end, gloriously end as we stand on this truth. For by grace we have been saved through faith. And this is not our decision. It is the gift of God, not the results of works, so that not a single person among us can boast. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we thank you for that truth. Thank you for salvation that has come to us through grace. It's not by works. And God, this is such an incredible example of how the early church handled this, Lord. God, may we 
not fall into the temptation of adding things to who we are in you, how we walk with you, Lord, but just believe in you, Father, and rest on you and rest on your promises. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.